afternoon, and thank you for attending the Arts in the Library's virtual festival. Today's session is Performance and Protest, the Art of Theater as Activism. As a reminder, you can submit questions at any time during the session, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. We'll get to as many as time allows. Brittany S. Harris is an assistant professor of theater in the Department of Communication and Theater Arts at Old Dominion University. Her areas of expertise are in race and performance, theater for social change, and performative community engaged programming. Throughout the Southeast regions of Virginia, North Carolina, Washington DC, and Georgia, Brittany has created numerous community engagement based projects and conducted workshops on solo performance development and device theater for the past 10 years. Community performance has long been used as a tool to challenge existing systems of power and to illuminate causes, issues, and people who are often oppressed, undermined, or underserved. Topics to be addressed are a brief exploration of the history of activist theater, performance-based strategies employed by activist organizations and social movements, and how performing artists have taken on social issues and engaged in activism by devising performance-based interventions. It is my pleasure to introduce Brittany S. Harris and Performance and Protest, the Art of Theater as Activism. So much, Helene, for that wonderful introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, this is such a delight to be here to kind of bring a, a little bit of a different light to the performance realm. And what does it look like to um, not only be a practitioner, but be able to track this work and be able to duplicate it. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and get started. So today's presentation is called Performance and Protest, the art of theater as activism. So keep in mind that this is not gonna be a total comprehensive way to look at theater as activism, um, but I want you to know what it is um, and then also what is it in, in explore and implores, right? And maybe perhaps you may think of yourself as an artist that does not just want to entertain, but enlighten and what does that mean? So let's get started. So of course, in true theater fashion, I have to ask you to do an activity, but granted you have the luxury of keeping your cameras off. But um, I wanna go ahead and ask you to go ahead and pull out your phone or a quick piece of paper, like a, a sticky note or something like that. And I wanna ask you to make a list of something really quickly. Okay, you ready? I want you to list five things that you are passionate about. Just five things. It can be the words, it can be a, a phrase or whatnot, but I, I'm going to actually join you all. Um, list five things that you are passionate about. This can be an affinity, this can be um, an interest, whatever that is. So go ahead and take a little time to write down just five things for yourself. I'm going to join. And keep in mind that uh, this is for you. So we don't have to worry about show and tell coming up at the end of the presentation or halfway through like, ha, ah, gotcha. No, it's not it. <laughs> Go ahead and try to take one more minute to write that out. I want you to really think about it. This idea of passion. <clears throat> Great, now as you're wrapping that up, go ahead and put that list to the side and believe me, I'll come back later in the presentation. So this idea of embodying a resolution um, at the foundation of our existence is the desire to identify in a, and understand one's own purpose. See artistic expression for years has been the outlet for exploring such depths. So in the means of theatrical performance, there is a platform that exists for artists to explore their own roots, questions about morals and society and spirituality. See, this work may provoke and invoke questions about not only those things that are highlighted or focused on, but mainly about the observer of the work. So it's about you being an observer and having a response to it. This use of performative work can be seen as a lens or maybe even a mirror to certain things. See, protests of any caliber are strategic in narrative. 
Think about it. They cast a protagonist. There's an antagonist. There's a setting. There's props, costumes. However, the specificity of using a stage, which can which can be like a traditional space or a found space, like a warehouse or the front of a Capitol building on a street corner, they can use this stage to amplify and address issues and systems of oppression on nationally charging issues that have a unique history. Um, it can also highlight um, methods that are beyond just what's in front of you and it can help you um, explore methods of how to execute them, right? So the topics kind of explored today that I'm gonna address is gonna be like a brief history of what the history of activist theater is, um, what does performative-based activism strategies look like, and then setting the stage. So how does performance artists take on social issues and engage in activism through their craft? So, just one moment, I think I have something in the chat. Oh, yes, it was uh, reiterated. If you all have questions or whatnot as we go along, go ahead and please drop that into the Q&A. So I want us to all kind of think and ponder on this statement. Um, typically, I use this as a call and response, but in true webinar form, I just want you to think about it. This idea that this work is not just for entertainment purpose or, um, but it's for enlightening purposes. I had someone call it edutainment, which I thought that was really funny. Um, what happens is this work is not meant to just entertain you. Like I'm gonna sit and engage in something. Oh, it's gonna make me feel this or that. But after you felt something, it doesn't just go away or you pass it on to a friend to say, hey, I saw this piece that did this. But also it makes you think and linger. It can be a lens for you. It can be a reflection of thought of things that have happened with you. So I want to keep in mind that this type of performative act um, activism work can invoke things. It can give you a new statement, a new perspective to look through. So a brief history of the art of activism. Um, theater as a form of activism and activism as a form of theater has been around for as long as I can remember. Using the theater to uh, raise awareness on rights issues not only educates an audience, but also creates empathy and a connection. Um, I kind of gave some examples that I thought were really nice to highlight about just where the lineage has been, not just in the US, but kind of around the world when it comes to um, activist theater. Um, I remember the Actresses Franchise League um, really was birthed in support of the women's suffrage movement. Um, protest theater of the 1960s and 70s. C these companies, even Bread and Puppet is still in existence now. Um, a, a practitioner that I use and method that I use called Theater of the Oppressed um, by Augusto Balau um, birthed this um, this form of methodology that engages in promoting social and political change. And when initially it started, it was based in the 70s, right out of Brazil, actually, that um, wanted to challenge um, the, or not necessarily challenge, but to place a different lens, if you will, with the radical left or the central left ideals and politics. I mean, even in the 90s and the 80s, with the Guerrilla Girls protesting the lack of female artists in New York and their galleries in which you see this idea that performance can be used to invoke and provoke change is, is pretty remarkable. And it's a big part of the work that we've done as artists. Um, even Bertolt Brett in this thing called Theater of the Absurd was designed to make audience think about issues and societal things in a different way and an almost uncomfortable way, but in that can figure out like, wow, that's an interesting perspective. So why this work? Why do we do this work? I mean, what's the difference between me just, you know, know going out here and, and writing a petition or the difference of me, um, I don't know, joining an online forum and just venting away. Like why, why do we do this work? So using theater as activism provides a set of collaborative skills that can be adapted for and to artists and spectators, right? Um, I could always just read a newspaper or scroll through a headline or a newsfeed or be inspired by a piece of visual art or just become totally disengaged. See, to, to change and consider multiple resolutions and in some cases becoming part of the resolution, that embodiment, is setting the stage for civil dialogue beyond our own individual admissions. So these collaborative skills, and I'm talking about through the use of theatrical performance, community building, and conflict resolution can help cultivate a more interactive and creative 
global society from the ground up. So right here is a little visual representation of what this work sort of looks like. We have some um, images of some forum theater, which is a Bilal technique, and also some image theater, which is a Bilal technique. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Um, but what does this work look like, right? It looks like a tool, and I want you to make a note of these bold words here. It's a tool of illumination. Um, it challenges systems of power. It can encourage um, interactive social collaborative process. So it's no longer just by the words, but your engagement. This is the one that I, I love. Um, it redefines societal roles and norms and extends a platform to amplify causes or culturally or socially relevant topics and issues that are often oppressed, undermined, and underserved. So I wanted to highlight one method um, or um, I can say method that I use and I believe has a really strong foundation in this type of work and it's called theater of the oppressed. I kind of mentioned this before. Um, it originated by a theater practitioner, Gusta Balau in the 1970s in Brazil and then actually expanded to Europe, which was wonderful. And it uses theater, like I said, in the means of promoting social and political change and alignment originally with like a radical left politic and then later a central left politic. Um, but theater of the oppressed itself is a genre of theater that develops and fosters an open interaction between the audience and the participants. What was really nice about this work is that it was actually birthed out of working with the peasant and worker populations in Brazil. And now it's used all over the world um, and mainly for political activism. It can also be used for conflict resolution, community building, therapy, even government legislation. What's really unique about this is this idea that the audience becomes active. They are called spect actors rather than spectators. They explore, they show, they analyze, and they transform the reality in which they are living. Um, you all will probably have heard of the pedagogy of the oppressed by Freire. Um, and this vision was inspired by him. Um, this idea that this type of theater not only is to entertain you, but is to foster that critical thinking that, huh, what if that other side, the other perspective. Augusta Bilal says, and this is something that resonates with me, the theater itself is not revolutionary. It is the rehearsal for the revolution. So right here, as you can see, is an image, image or images of image theater. Um, and this in particular, I did this actually when I, uh, last summer for the ODU art series, it was called Resilient Stillness. And I led a workshop in this idea of embodying um, process through what's going on with COVID-19 and the pandemic. And I gave a platform to take away the words and allow for us to physically express the angst that we feel, our relationship to certain words, to the medical jargon that we're hearing, to the headlines that we're seeing. What happens when the words are not enough and our bodies are responding? How do we react? So um, this is another collaborative tool in which still images are used to explore abstract concepts, such as relationships and emotions, as well as realistic situations. What I love is this is a tool. Remember I said these are collaborative tools? and that's how we build the foundation for activist theater. This is a tool of expression. So the arts can be a place that can not only be entertainment, but you can be influenced, you can be challenged, and it can also provide a forum for catharsis and empathy. So great, I just gave you a really nice overview and some history. So how do we do this? Like, how do we do this work? How do I, identify it, right? So I wanna kind of go over um, what are some of the performative-based activism strategies? What's the praxis, right? How was this work documented or archived, right? We're doing this presentation for the library. So how does it go beyond just watching a piece? Do we record it? Are there journals? Do we submit for this? Do we document this? So, you know, beyond the practical, just about the practical beyond the theory. What are the strategies used, the ideology, and how can this be applied? So these strategies um, identify it as, as a movement for social transformation through the use of play and performance. 
And the ideology that we use is informed by other factors, right? These factors are, could be your gender, it can be your sex, it can be your race, it can be your um, economic background, your politics. But one thing to keep in mind is that um, the performative-based activism strategies are rooted in relationship, okay? So it's about the social, again, collaborative process of discovery and the creation of new ideas, new roles, new relationships, and new activities. Remember how I said that it allows you to rethink those social norms. So I wanted to pull um, some images of some examples of true performance-based activism. I'm pretty sure some of these look familiar, especially the first one right around 2017, um, when we're looking at the issues of women's rights and we went through the pussy hat movement, right? This idea of women, women's rights and feminism, all that launching together. And look at the use of performance here. Remember how I identified those narrative, right? The, the costumes, the set, the villain, the protagonist. Right here, I mean, the use of the hats is a type of costuming that united an issue, right? Um, when we go over here to um, the Article 55, the Lebanon um, rape law, this was very powerful if you haven't heard about it. Um, it was um, also an exhibit, but also they had um, live artists walking around and these were women dressed as brides and in bandages um, calling for the um, abolishment of a law that exonerates a rapist if he's married to the victim. So what you see here are these wedding dresses hanging um, to show kind of the death to your own voice once you become married. I mean, look at that, that is performance, right? You're setting up the setting. You have these players, these actors that are embodying this, wearing these dresses. You use the use of blood, the use of makeup, right? That's telling the narrative. And it also defines a clear antagonist or something that makes you consider what the antagonist is. And then on a, a, a more of an artistic, um, STEM related side, there's the project, um, the Crossroads project um, that's built, like I said, in arts in the STEM and it's the use of powerful storytelling. And I love this. It was a form of poetic science. Ah, love it. It's the use of our um, environmental art to force a visual understanding and then um, powerful use of music to inspire deep and personal contemplation. See what I love, um, about this type of work and that it, it can be experimental, it can be political, it can be educational, but it can also be psychological. See, this type of work has an emergence of, of its own new set of criteria and possible theories. So while all of these strategies are just a base, um, what can be extended through all of this can be a multiple to a multitude of things. So, the purpose, right? So the big question when we go in and do this work is what is our intent and what is our impact? And the intent can be enforced uh, by the community that you're working with. It can be by um, an issue. It can be by a protest or something of that sort. Um, and then how to track the impact. So what is the end game? What do you want? What are the outcomes, right? Um, and these can be through confrontation, the, these type of um, purposes and methods can be through confrontation, it can be demonstration, it can be protest. But the big thing I want you to pull away from this is what is your intent and what is your impact? So these are things to consider when you're building your purpose and method to this type of work, right? Um, I want you to look at the performative action the visual, we just talked, we just seen two examples of some really nice visual uh, representation of performative based activism, right? With the, the hats and the brides and the, and the dresses. But then sometimes it's textual. Maybe, pardon me, it's about a petition that needs to be signed. But in order to do so, I need to have this visual performance, but then I want to give you this piece of paper to read. Or, the textual can be in those picket signs. What are the signs saying? All of these type of methods. Another thing to keep in mind is the importance of audience participation. Is this work meant to be seen and experienced or do you want to be lectured at, right? Also the importance of location. And that, this is not just about where it's being performed at, but the advantage of being where the art is actually happening 
the, the movement on Wall Street, all of those things, right? You have to be where it is in order to protest it. That was a part of performance activism. Them, them maybe even dressing in suits or having the briefcases and stuff like that, right? Um, also the importance of mobility. And this is not just in the performance, but um, not just where the performance is or where it's performed, but can this work move? Can it be adapted to a virtual setting, right? Right now, when we're in this pandemic, we still have um, issues that are coming up, especially a, a big one is the Black Lives Matter movement, right? It was right at the start of the pandemic when we had an, a re-rise of this whole thing, right? With George Floyd. So this idea of while we are kind of confined to our homes, how do we still enforce what we need to say? This birth of the hashtag, this birth of sharing, um, the, the, a big one was blacking out your pictures, right? This idea of showing this visual representation, right? And then also, again, going to the intent and mission for who and what. And then the big one for me is how do you assess it? So great, I've given you all this information. I've asked you to reconsider and rethink things and maybe even, um, shift a perspective or whatnot, or just enlighten. But how do you track that? And we sometimes do that through talk back forms and stuff like that. Um, we can do online surveys. It can be quantitative more than qualitative or vice versa. Like, hey, how do we track this many people who came, right? So this goes back to the very first thing I asked you to do. I asked you to list five things that you are passionate about. This work is led by your curiosity and your passion. So when you think about um, a project or an issue or passion, if you were to wanna implement this work, you have to identify from this passion, is there a community that supports this passion? And then within that community of that passion, is there a potential partner in that community to then supplement this type of work? And then you always want to go in with a, a guiding question. What, what, what's leading you on this? So beyond this, just being a passion, why is this a passion? And then what's firing you up about it? This is the guide that I use as I'm about to wrap up the presentation um, and how I do my work. So I, I do a lot of solo performance and devise theater, this idea of starting and creating something from scratch with your whole team. So basically you have a topic or maybe a, a little headline from a newspaper and you build on that, right? So it's this idea of having a concept and then you wanna create something, you're gonna have a performance and then you wanna document it. Um, even what my solo work, my solo work is in response to what's happening in the news. It's called breathing life into the black and white or essentially breathing life into the headlines, going beyond what I, I see given to me and the numbers, right? But how do I respond to that? So these are some goals that I keep in mind. The concept, do you have a question? Then you wanna have a, a statement, right? A research statement, definitely a question. Um, and then in creating this, do you wanna devise it? Do you wanna have a devising team? Is it just a solo work or? And you wanna to work towards a finished product, project? Then the performance, right? You wanna put something out there essentially after you've identified your passion and your community and all that. But keep in mind that it's not about creating the product, it's about enjoying the process and what this work does you know, answer those questions for you. What's firing up? Did you find your answers for things? And then the end, when it comes down to how do we document this and how do we get this work out there? How do we let people see it, right? We document it through the text, through the videos, through photos and feedback, but it also is about archiving. So as a, as a practitioner, and I call myself a scarlet artist, not only do I enjoy creating the work, I love processing about the work. And then there are journals and publications that support that, then there's also recordings of the rehearsals and the whole process. There are interviews that we, um, we um, engage in and journals that we write in, that personal journals. And so I want you to look at this as possibly a, a way for if you were to take this passion and illuminate it and amplify it beyond just a passion on a piece of paper, what would it look like? So I do hope that you all have enjoyed this overview of looking at performance um, as a type of activism. And I would love to go ahead and just shift over to um, our q and I am here to answer as much as I can as possible. And thank you so much.
Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brittany. That was amazing. Oh, thank you. Our first question is, when you say locations, did you have to scout to picture where to perform? Absolutely. This comes back to that whole thing about identifying the community, right? Um, and so um, I've done some work with the um, housing redevelopment that's going on in St. Paul's and in St. Paul Quadrant. And I, I noticed that while I was working with the community and I was working at a place called Teens with a Purpose, they have a really nice facility, but I realized a lot of the narratives that were coming out was based of what their homes look like. And some of them had already um, been kind of evacuated from. And so I took a lot of our sessions and developing the work, we went to an abandoned home and we were able to write and like sit in the staircase and be in the environment and actually fed a different aesthetic than us just sitting in a room and just talking about it. So it does take a little bit of scouting. Um, it does take a little bit of research before probably initiating that contact with the community, understand the community. Um, something that I found is that um, you wanna probably note where the people talk, where the people go, right? Um, that's where I'm gonna get the narratives from. People like to convene at this certain bus stop or this certain place, right? Um, and so location is prime and it starts with just kind of doing a little bit of research in the community before jumping in and probably um, connecting with an advocate or with someone from the community to get things going. Make sure you've done your, your research so far. Thank you. Here's our next question. I've heard a lot of debate about whether recasting, for example, Macbeth with all um, actors of color or Julius Caesar with all female actors is actually an effective form of activism. The issue seems to be that it looks like a statement, but by keeping the entirely original story, the possibility of exploring the story through another lens is lost a bit and therefore not the most effective. How do you feel about this type of theater? And do you think there's a better way to make it more effective than it seems to be now? Wow. Um, it actually takes me directly to a Bilal quote that says, uh, theater is politics and politics is theater. It comes with confrontation. It comes with being uncomfortable. It comes with challenging, you know? And so um, it's going to be political regardless of how it's cast, right? Even if it's traditional, if you want to get back to real traditional, women weren't on stage period, you know? So we wanna go back to where things really started, right? Um, but I, I do think um, that type of work uh, shifting in and, and, you know, and just keep, keep it real, Shakespeare is in public domain. I mean, you know, I think the, the true challenge is sometimes comes with these traditional playwrights that are very rooted in this is how my show looks. Don't consider this outside the norm. And you wanna respect the playwright in the estate, but then also what about the artistic freedom and expression of an artist? Um, and then that's where it, it comes down to um, what's being limited or is this a political statement or not? At least that's, that's my opinion. Um, but I do think, um, continuing in that direction, creating work that can break molds. That's what it's supposed to do. And then I always, always incite and invite a talk back. And I know people are like, I don't wanna stay for a talk back. There's ways to do good talk backs. There's a good one called Liz Lerman called the critical response, response process. It's amazing. It's used for artists um, to communicate with the community. It's, it's, it's actually an engaging process more so than just a talk back about just the work itself and asking a Q&A, um, but it engages you. It allows you to say what's, what opinions, opinions you may have, what questions you may have. Um, but then also it lets you say, this lingered with me this way. Was this your intent? Um, and I think that goes back to that initial question of what is your intent and what is your impact? Um, and so I do think that work being explored in, in that way, it should can just continue um, in respect I will say that, and I will say that for Shakespeare, like I said, it's a little different just because it's a public domain. Um, but uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'm pretty sure you've, maybe you all haven't heard. There were a couple examples in the last five years. There's this piece by Katori Hall called The Mountaintop. It's a two person show, very strong show. And it features the night before uh, Martin Luther King is assassinated. Um, he's in his hotel, Lorraine, and he has this interaction with this nurse. I'm not gonna spoil everything, but not nurse, I mean, a housekeeper. No, I'm not gonna spoil anything because it's a really good 
ending. But nonetheless, uh, university decided to put on a, um, to cast Martin Luther King as a white man. And it, oh uh, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, and, and, and Katori Hall was in, in, in London working on um, the new Tina that now is now here, but in the Western she was working on Tina there. So she was like, she, I, if I can recall, either she called in or flew back or something, something happened in the fact that she had to come speak to them. Um, but there's this idea of um, how do you represent and understand the cultural sensitivity of this work? This work is very specific. So it does not mean that someone could not do research and, and possibly feel that there's a connection to Martin Luther King, you know, you're white or whatever. Um, but this idea of the performance, what does it show? What does it mean to put these words of a black man in your mouth and what does that perspective mean? And so those, when it comes down to the intent, right? Was it meant to be controversial just to start something up? Or was it honestly, we're trying to make a statement and in doing so, what was the statement? And I can't answer that of course, but you all should look into it. Um, but it, it's, it was a really, I think it was in the last five years, but hopefully that answered it. I know it was a long, long winded way to answer that question, but I do think that we should challenge um, with respect. <laughs> um, I have just a comment here um, I'd like to share. It says, I really appreciate how you took performance out of the theater house and into our real-time lives. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question. Are there ways to transform already created productions into um, activist interpretations? Absolutely. And the first thing would be is to take it out of a theater setting period and really immersing it in the community. So traditional theater spaces is, you know, either proscenium, you're sitting in an audience and you're right there, taking it somewhere else, boom even putting it outside, putting it in a warehouse, putting it in a parking garage, whatever that set constitutes the story. No, don't set it. Don't have like a, I mean, if you want, uh, you know, as a, a counseling session in a play and you're in the parking garage, I don't know if that's your logic, just, okay, that's fine. But I will say um, taking it out of the, the traditional um, realm or the framework, if you will, of the play. That's a great way to take pieces and adapt them. Also, it's breaking down um, the, the piece itself. This is some good old script analysis stuff here, right? Like breaking down what this piece is about. Is it about um, the specificity of a certain community? If that's the case, then maybe you want to set this in a community that looks similar in your, in your neighborhood or in your community, right? Like, wow, this is exploring the, uh, the interracial issues between black and white and gentrification. Oh, I do know that that is kind of happening in Norfolk right now. Perhaps I can consider performing this there um, and then connecting with a partner there to talk about this work and then having a talk back um, at the end about how this work can inform the community. Um, it's this idea of what is the message and the intent? I'm gonna keep going back, I feel like I'm repeating it, but it, it is important of any time we perform there, hopefully there's some intent rather than just putting butts in the seat and getting some money, but what is the intent? And that usually comes, not only if you're breaking it out of the realm of you know the producer and artistic director, but as a director and their vision, as a visionary, what is your intent and purpose? So I do think that even pieces that have been set for years, I mean, how many times have we seen different renditions of Shakespeare? I mean, let's keep it real, I mean, I've seen, I've seen Julius Caesar, uh, Romeo and Juliet multiple ways, even through like text messaging. I mean, I think Virginia Stage Company did an amazing example of that at one point a few years back. I mean, just this idea of adapting to the community and serving that community, but still keeping in mind, what do you want that impact to be? So you have your intent, but what about your impact? So what do you want them to take away from this? What is it for? So yeah, I think anything can be adaptable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we have another question. Um, what are the biggest challenges in developing performance activism? Um, let's see. Respect. Um, because I think sometimes as artists, we want our perspective to, to uh, be the thing that needs to be highlighted, but sometimes it's not about what you want is about who you serve for this work or the, um, the community that you want to connect with. Um, this work, uh, this actually came up in a workshop I just did recently. 
sometimes you have to ask yourself, is this doing more harm than good? Taking this work out there, wanting to um, go and protest in front of the steps of City Hall. Like, is it because you want to be seen? And if so, you need to make sure you have your, your camera crew there, something like that, so it can be seen. Like you have, you have to have intent here, right? Like I told you that performative nature of it. Um, but the, the tough part will, will be is making sure that you're doing the work, not just for your own value and your own self. Um, and if it's a passion of yours, then identifying affinity groups, people that share in that infinity with you that can serve in that. Remember, I pointed out the word collaborative so many times because this work is about being social. Um, this individualism or the individualistic way of looking at work when it comes down to performance activism is, is quite moot. It doesn't exist. Um, I mean, I, I highly, don't, I highly don't believe if, if there's one person that just feels one way about what you feel. There's people that can supplement and complement that. Um, and then I would extend it out to, if you're not sure about how to approach something, then ask, right? We have a beautiful resource here at ODU. You have not just in the communication and theater arts department, but in our other departments around campus, those who have an affinity for what you do do your research, connecting with a university. We're always looking for somebody to do research with. <laughs> we always have our research agenda and connecting with that. And so beyond your community partner, you can have your research partner as well. So in how to approach that. But I believe sometimes the hardest work is just making sure that the work is going to be done in a way that's respecting whatever the issue is and make sure that you've done your research. Um, again, I think that's the first thing I led with. Know the environment, know the issue. Do your research. See if there's already um, an entity that's already doing work like you and see if you can complement and supplement them. You notice they're doing a lot of textual stuff. They're putting flyers on people's doors. Perhaps you can convince them to do a piece of street art with you. Like, hey, how can we take the words on this piece of paper and amplify them beyond the black and white? Can we use the text you have and make a visual representation? It's that simple. You don't even have to come up with your own words. The text is already there. That's what I mean about respecting the work and then collaborating. So I hope that answered that person's question. Um, one, one, I think this will be the last question. Mm -hmm. um, the last performance that ODU Rep was able to provide in person was Echoes. Mm -hmm. And that wow. was your devised piece. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> it's been a long time. Holy crap, that's been a year. Holy yes. <laughs> but it's, it's a perfect example of the type of art you're talking about. So I wondered if you could sort of walk us through that real life example um, about the process that you've outlined today. Sure. Oh my goodness. Um, I followed my my step by step to a T with I echoes, know. mainly because um as in a beautiful way, I'm a, a part of the community of ODU. Um, I'm a graduate of this pro of the program that I'm serving now, right? To be a professor and be an advocate in my own program was right there. There's the passion. I, I mean, I can get emotional. I get emotional with my partner all the time talking about it because I am now here. But I also know that there were certain issues that were not highlighted and amplified while I was there. So to my astonishment, coming back some years later and still hearing some of those same issues, I knew that I could take that to the stage to amplify it also being respectful of the space that we're in, right? And respectful of those participating in it. And so the concept um, in building is that I wanted to create a piece that um, modeled the framework of Intezaki's For Colored Girls, this choreo poem, this idea of not just having to say what you feel or say it at the audience, but immerse the audience. And then also immerse yourself in developing the work itself. And it can be through movement, it can be through, um, poetry. It can be through monologues. It can be through scene work. It can be through playing an instrument, whatever. And I wanted to use the stage for that. Um, and so in, in true devised fashion, we had a framework, like I said, the Coria poem. I knew there were certain topics that I wanted to address that were my own affinity, but then I also gave the stage 
if you will, the room to them to speak about what they wanted to and I allowed them to amplify their own voices. I allowed um, uh, my actors to go on a journey coming in and these, a lot of them had not worked with each other before. We had a cast of eight wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actors who gave their all. Um, and I was very grateful and, and for the vulnerability and honesty, um, but then also wanting to make sure they told their own stories and I wasn't telling them for them. So I knew I had my own experience with ODU and my, my infinity with it, but I knew I wanted them to have them have the stage. So nonetheless, in developing that, um, I came in stitching it together, right? I, I had the outline. That's what it is. I outlined it out. That was my concept. Outline, I knew what my beginning, middle, and end looked like. I knew what topics I wanted to hit. I knew at this moment we're going to need a break. I, this is the artistic mind. This is the, this is the years of study. This is, <laughs> this is the degree coming out now, right? All right, this is too much talking. Now we need some entertainment. We got to dance. Got to make the audience laugh, levity, stuff like that, telling these stories. Um, and, the, and, the, and just to let you all know if who hadn't seen Echoes, it was this idea of the thoughts that echo in our mind right? The years of um, that mother within, that auntie within, that person within telling you, girl, you're not pretty enough. Girl, you're not the shiniest penny. What does that mean to cast down and out those echoes and create your own echoes of affirmation? So that was the building. Then it came down to like the, the performance and, 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 and building the actual script itself and rehearsing and finding the rhythm of all of that. And then in the documentation, Right. Um, we had two ways for the audience to kind of express how they felt. Um, we had a nice traditional feedback form that was online, but then we also created like this booth, this visual booth that people could then put their own echoes into the show to be released. This idea of I've heard this, I felt this, I'm connected to this and I can let this go. Um, and then also we were able to lead a beautiful community talk back um, that not only brought in practitioners, but also scholars that could talk about the importance of sharing narrative with someone from our ODU counseling center there. We had an advocate from the, the area that talked about the importance of storytelling. Um, and it was just remarkable to serve on this panel that could help pour back into the ODU community. And this is again in my, my last and rounding this up, this idea of having this tool, this additional tool of performative measures that then activated the other resources available, the counseling center, other people to connect to in the community, but also showing an importance for peer-to-peer -peer interaction to be supportive of one another. And then just giving them the space and the word I used to use, permission to do so. And so um, in the end, um, the work was uniting in a way that I, I couldn't have even asked for, not only for myself, for the performers, but the audience as well. And um, what's really nice is that that work was left in the space, but still lingers with us. And that just felt remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a, a couple extra things come in right at <laughs> <laughs> uh, one I will have to, I'll have to partially answer and I'll throw it out to Helene and you as well um, is echoes available in the library and I do not have an archived uh, copy of it but Brittany if you'd like to give me one <laughs> I believe Helene pass it we have one um, don't we pass it to <laughs> we do Collaboration. There you go. <laughs> there it <At> is. Test. <laughs> I was typing. If if um if you would like to email me, I can send you a link to that. Excellent. And I believe my email went out publicly. If not, I will put it in again here. And we just have one wonderful uh, comment saying thank you so much for your work it is so inspiring and definitely needed which oh, well, thank you so much. thank you um as i said before this is why we do the work the dialogue this right here you know we're we're supposed to not just take it in we're supposed to reflect it out right um and i'm i'm just grateful again that we have a platform to do so i mean this initiative that we're making and i was sharing this with laura before to connect the arts to this sort of 
how do we archive this? How do we document this? You know, there is a process to this. We want to share that with you all. We want you to have these resources for how to duplicate this. Um, and also how to connect with those who can help you duplicate it. And so this is a really beautiful forum for that and opportunity. So I, I really thank you both for moderating. And then also, Laura, I know I'm taking your job, but you've dropped some beautiful things in the <laughs> chat uh, about uh, archive theater arts records. I'm pretty sure Laura was set. <laughs> I was trying to, I was looking as you were, you were talking like, I, we have that collection. Let me get there you go. That's a <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we have a few more comments. There are a, a, a herd of thank yous and, and this has been amazing. And there is also one that says, you are so inspiring as a young black woman. I am inspired and I hope to one day be able to give back like you. That is from one of our current majors. Thank, there's, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I, I love what we do. And if you current major want to chat more with me, please do. <laughs> or anyone, even if you're not a current major, if you're just someone from the community that's come in or anyone from our ODU community or the state at large, whatever please connect with me. I, I, would, I would love to be an advocate in any way I can. I send prospectives to you all the time. <laughs> you Thank you, Zwalin. <laughs> <laughs>